Tonight we have some very special guests with us. We're going to share with you all about what a career as a combined laboratory and x-ray technologist or CLXT could look like. Maybe this is the first time you've heard of a CLXT or maybe it's a career you've already researched on your own. Either way, tonight's presenters will be able to answer any questions you may have about this exciting and in-demand job. First, we will hear from Lisa George from Nate, who will share what the education pathway for a CLXT looks like. And then we'll hear from Carter Leggin, a current student in the Nate program who is out on placement and can tell you about his journey into this role and what working out in rural Alberta has been like so far. So I will now turn things over to Lisa to get us started. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you're doing well this evening. Uh, just to share a little bit of background about myself, I am a CLXT. Uh, I took the program at Nate and graduated, worked out in rural Alberta uh, for a few years at a few different sites, uh, and then had a wonderful opportunity to come work at Nate. And I've been working at Nate with the CLXT program for the last 12 years and have thoroughly enjoyed it. So here to share with you a little bit of information about the program for combined lab and x-ray technologists. So first of all, just in case uh, there are anyone, you know, folks on the call that are not very familiar, I thought I would just cover a little bit about what a CLXT does. So we do produce radiographic images, so x-rays. Um, we work the equipment, we do maintenance, and um, we work with other healthcare providers to communicate needs of the patients and um, the needs around obtaining those images. We also perform ECGs or electrocardiograms. So those are the heart tests with the stickers that you may have seen or had that test before. And we also collect and analyze bodily fluids, including blood and urine. So we use very sophisticated um, analyzers and technology. We also use microscopes to review specimens and report those findings um, with the highest quality and accuracy to the healthcare team to provide those diagnostic information. Most importantly, we provide high quality patient-centered care to all, regardless of their race, ethnic origin, color, gender, sexual orientation, or religious or political um, affiliation. Um, so we're really there to support the communities and make sure that they have the best care possible. As a role in healthcare, uh, technology is current or constantly evolving rather. Um, so we do continue our education throughout the length of our career to make sure that we're maintaining our competence and keeping up with the, the changes that are rapidly happening. And most importantly, I want to emphasize that this is a career that is predominantly um, focused on supporting rural healthcare centers. So we're talking communities with 10,000 people or even less, um, where there's a smaller patient volume in the area and we're able to provide um, the supports in both diagnostic imaging and laboratory services uh, for a small team, which means we get to be very closely connected with the staff, the other healthcare professionals within the facility. And you do get to know your team and patients um, very well, which is a uh, personally, in my experience, a very rewarding uh, experience. So at Nate, uh, we have a fall intake every year, which begins in September. This year, we welcomed 71 students to our Edmonton campus, and that's the most we've ever had. So we're keeping up with the, the demands that are needed uh, for the support out in industry currently. Okay, so... The program is two years long, so just kind of walk you through what that experience looks like. You'd begin in September, you will have five courses that will run um, from September until you know mid-December, so 15 weeks long, get a bit of a break, and then you'll come back in January and until the end of April, you'll complete five new courses. Um, both of these terms have a mix of both lab and x-ray courses. 
And then we have a spring term, which takes place in May and June. So it is only an eight week term and three courses. So it's a little bit faster paced. So we have fewer courses as a part of that. So these three terms make up the entire first year of the program. And that all takes place at night. Then you get a little bit of a break, usually the month of July. Um, where you'll be looking to relocate to your training site, which could be anywhere in Alberta. The clinical training portion of the program is 40 weeks long. That's the second year of the program. And you will be placed at a site, like I said, anywhere in Alberta. We do have a process uh, in the beginning of the first year of the program where you are given a full list of sites that have been approved to train students and you submit your top three choices and we do the best we can to place you at one of those three choices um, and then you'll be going out to that site for the entire 40 weeks. Most of the sites you'll be located in that one community. There may be a few sites that are split or you have another opportunity to go to a nearby location, but for the majority, you'll be at one location. The clinical training starts in August and you will complete a lab foundations and an x-ray foundations courses. And what those are is you'll be doing your training alongside um, registered technologists that support your continued growth and learning while you're working to support patients and complete exams right there in the hospital. Those two courses are 10 weeks long each. So that pretty much takes you to the break over the holidays at the end of December. You get a small break and then you would return to the same site to continue your training um, with five week rotations between lab and x-ray. Um, for the most part, you are working during the day, during your clinical training. But in the second portion of your clinical training, we will be mixing in a variety of shifts where you might be working evenings, a couple weekends and on call um, as it applies to your site. So you really get a full understanding of the different vari variations of patients and exams that occur at different times. Um, and also for the scope of the profession as it is shift work, um, supporting the, the work in the hospitals. So this clinical training runs until the end of May. And like I said, 40 weeks in total. And once you're done that, you've completed the program successfully and are on your way to an opportunity to write your professional licensing exam and, and begin work. Um, somewhere in Alberta, hopefully. Going back to the first year of the program, we always get the question, you know, what can we expect within the program? It is a full-time program. Five courses is quite heavy, keeps you very busy. So just, um, this is an approximation. It may change from year to year, but we do see approximately 12 hours per week attending labs. So that's over 50% of your time is getting to work hands-on with equipment in our lab settings, which is really great. Um, 10 hours of lecture on campus. And then we do have, so far, we've been able to maintain one virtual day a week for synchronous learning online through Zoom or Microsoft Teams call, but it is a scheduled time. Then approximately, the, it does fluctuate, but we would recommend you know, 10 to 20 hours per week for studying, completing assignments, you know, preparing for your lab activities, that sort of thing. Um, so total, it kind of adds up to around 40 to 50 hours per week. Again, this may fluctuate depending on the time of the term. If you're leading up to you know, a heavy assessment week or the end of the term, that kind of thing. Uh, but we do our best to try to spread it out as much as we can and work together um, with the other courses to spread it out. <laughs> <clears throat> 
So here's a, a few pictures of our lab spaces at Nate. Uh, the top image is our phlebotomy and ECG lab, where you get to work with things like fake arms when you're starting to practice how to collect blood. And then you would go to working with partners with students and um, direct supervision with instructors on practicing taking each other's blood and doing ECGs on each other. The middle photo is in our x-ray lab. This is one of five of our x-ray units where students every week they're in there practicing different x-ray positions, how to use the equipment, how to really achieve those high diagnostic quality images. Uh, we do not image people in our x-ray labs, but we do have um, phantoms is what we call them that you can practice taking images. So you'll really get to hone your craft during the clinical training portion. And the bottom photo here is in our hematology lab where you can see the students are um, looking at some blood slides on their microscopes and getting very comfortable with identifying the different cells that they would see on those slides. So we have a total of five different laboratory spaces at Nate, um, all kind of close together in one area. And we also um, have access and do utilize the Center for Advanced Medical Simulation at Nate, where you get to practice um, mostly communication and teamwork um, scenarios um, to see how it might go in real life, um, talking to patients and other healthcare professionals. And this is just going to help prepare you, you know, to move out into industry as all the hands-on time that you can get with the technology that which we see out in industry today. So it feels very comfortable to move into that second portion during your clinical training. Okay, so what does it take to apply to the program? So we have four entrance requirement courses. You would need to have a minimum of 63% in these. So grade 12 English 30-2 um, or language arts, grade 12 math, math 30-2, um, grade 12 chemistry, chem 30 or bio 30. And just see a question pop through. This program is not available at SAIT. We are the only program in Alberta for the CLXT program. Ages of students really range. We have students coming straight out from high school. Um, we have students coming back for their second career or maybe after a bit of experience and in other post-secondary programs or courses. So it does range quite a bit. Uh, I myself took the program when I was 24. So you will see a, a variety there. You do need both chemistry and biology as entrance requirements. And this is linked to the lab portion of our program. It's very beneficial to support going into those courses within the program. Okay, so we also have two courses that are prerequisites to the program. So you don't have to have these courses completed to apply to the program, but you would have to have them completed by July 31st if you were accepted into the program to start in the fall, let's say. So the, we have the human anatomy and physiology course, as well as the medical terminology courses. These um, are offered online virtually through NATE in our continuing education program uh, department, rather. So you can take them at NATE, um, or if you've taken these courses at another institute, you can submit a request for credit as long as it's been completed within five years of your application um, submission deadline. Um, and it does need to meet kind of our course outlines within 80% of what we have included in the courses offered at NEAT. You would need to have a final grade of 60% or greater um, to have it qualify for that prerequisite requirement. And this photo here, I love, this is within our SIM center uh, with two students using a mobile x-ray machine. Okay. So in terms of the competitive selection process, we did recently have a change this year. 
Um, so how it works now is applicants who meet the program's minimum entrance requirements, so that's 63% in those four courses, um, once you submit your application, if you meet that, you will be offered uh, an opportunity to complete an interview. Once your interview is complete, your or your admission into the program is based solely on your interview score. And so applications or applicants rather with the highest interview score will be admitted first. And then approximately four months after applications open, if there are additional seats available, they will look to see yet other varying interview scores for consideration rather. The first round of interviews is expected to occur in mid-October, so I can't emphasize enough the importance of applying early. And the applications did open today for the fall September intake of 2025. So it is... Um, it's really best to get your applications in as soon as possible. Um, and applications will only remain open for at least one month from the opening date. If we have filled our quota, they will close at the end of October. If there is still more space available, they will remain open until that quota has been filled. So that is the process um, around applications into the program. We do offer um, a number of resources to help applicants prepare for the, that interview process. And there is um, information available on the NATE website as well. I can pop that in the chat later. And we do also have an open house coming up um, later this month on October 26th, which is a great opportunity if you can make it into Nate um, in Edmonton to stop by the Celix T booth. You'll be able to speak with staff as well as students to ask any questions that you may have. But of course, you can reach us, reach out to us as well um, at this program inbox, which is CLXT at nate.ca. Awesome. Thanks, Lisa. There are quite a few questions rolling in. So I think we'll we'll get to questions around the programming now uh, before we move on to Carter. So uh, just to try and keep up with the few I've seen in the chat, uh, there Thank was a you. question around, could you complete the two, uh, I'm assuming the two prerequisite courses while you're still in high school? Yes, you can. Um might be tough, <laughs> you'd be pretty busy, I'm thinking, but you definitely can. It only needs to be completed within five years um, related to your application date. So if you wanted to get ahead and do that, you certainly can. We do have a number of students that are accepted into the program and then work on it, you know, in the spring or summer before they begin as well. So it's not a requirement for your application. Okay. And then there was a question as well. Uh, what is the interview process like? Yeah, that is a great question. So it is um, virtual, so, which is really nice for most of our applicants that are not located in Edmonton. You will be sent an invitation to complete an interview uh, given a, a window. You know, I think it's usually about a week to complete it. And then once you start it, you'll have to complete um, about five questions. And you get a chance to, you know, watch a video with someone reading the question to you as well as have the question on the screen. You get maybe a minute to think about what your response is going to be. And then you record it and submit it that way. Um, so that is typically how it goes. We are hoping with this new interview process that it's going to speed up our ability to rate and review interviews, therefore accepting students into the program much sooner so you have more time to prepare. Awesome. Uh, so in the Q&A here we have, is there a certain amount of credits you need to qualify? There's not a certain amount of credits. It is solely based on those four entrance courses. So bio, chem, math, and English. Riley asks, what happens if you're still doing your high school courses? And I'm not 100% sure oh. if you just mean in the context of applying for the program when you're still doing high school courses, but maybe you... I think that's too. likely the case. And okay. we do conditional acceptance. So mm -hmm. you would be offered an interview based on your 
current standing in your courses. Um, and then you, if you met the interview score, um, you would be offered conditional acceptance. And then obviously it would need to follow up with the completion of your high school courses. Is the program accepted in other provinces? I think I understand that question to mean like, could you go work in other provinces after you complete the program? And absolutely. So um, definitely the I think the highest concentration of Celix teas are located in Alberta um, and Saskatchewan, as there's also a, a program at Sask Polytech. Um, but we are seeing quite a bit of growth for Celix teas in BC, as well as Manitoba, and even maritime provinces in Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland and Labrador. So um, there is quite a bit of uh, mobility happening right now. Do Portage College courses count for the human anatomy and physiology and medical terminology? It's really hard to say uh, without having looked at the course outline. Um, there can be quite a bit of variation from different institutes around those courses. So you would have to just submit those to see if they would meet the requirements. Do you need to have Chem 30 to do the human anatomy, physiology and medical terminology courses? You do not. It, the courses are offered through our continuing education department, and so they're not connected to a program. They're just open for, you know, first person to register. Um, so there's no requirement of any other courses. What sort of questions will be asked in the interview? Um, these type of questions are really trying to understand applicants' character and um, fit for the role of healthcare um, in general. So yeah, I think really wanting to see that you're interested in providing care, you have, um, you're empathetic, you're open to providing care to, like I said, a wide variety of population and understand the different dynamics that come along with working in healthcare and that, you know, the people that, that we care for are often not having the best day you know they're they can be scared they can be experiencing um, a lot of pain and being able to support people in, in all different conditions um, comes you know it speaks a lot to your ability to connect with people communicate um, also work as a team uh, healthcare is a team sport is what I like to say and you definitely need to be able to communicate and have strong interpersonal skills. So they, they link to those kind of concepts. They can be very general questions. Um, and yeah, I think maybe that's all safe for now. So I don't take up too much time, but there, is, there are more resources that we have um, available at Open House, as well as we do offer kind of interview prep sessions throughout the year too. How long after the interview um, will you be notified if you've been accepted or not? Since this is a new process this year, I don't have a definitive answer. We will be regularly rating the interviews as they come in um, on a month by month basis. So I'm hopeful that means that you would receive a response sooner than later. Um, but I, I don't have, you know, the definite answer. Last year, we were able to notify applicants I would say later in, in, in March and April, and we're looking to see that move up considerably sooner this year. Uh, so I'm seeing a, quite a few questions in the chat around specifics around, um, like I'm doing my chem 30 right now, do I have to wait? I think probably for those types of questions that are really specific to the courses that you're taking, it'd probably be best to send a message to that email, that CLXT email that uh, Lisa had indicated, um, just because in the interest of time, um, those can get pretty nuanced, the answers based on, you know, where you're at in your schooling and things like that. So we'll try and keep some of our questions to a little bit more general and uh, there, there's resources and, and advisors and things at the post-secondaries that can get really specific looking at the courses that you're taking right now. Um, so, oh, there was a question around where you could find prep sessions, information on the prep sessions. On our website, I will look it up when Cartier is speaking so I can share the, the direct link for you.
Uh, this might be kind of a varied answer for me, Lisa, but you have personal experience. Do you think that going straight to the course is preferable or taking some time off after high school? Oh, yeah, I think that's a personal uh, decision for sure. Some people, they know what they want to do and they're really excited to get into it. Um, that wasn't my path. I actually had a different career before going into healthcare. Like I said, I, I took the program at 24. Um, but we see students of all different ages be successful in the program. So I think it's just really is the timing right for you. Uh, there was a question around, is COVID vaccination required to enter the program? Currently, no. We follow the um, Alberta health requirements. So if that ever changes, we would we would follow that, but not currently. We do have quite a few immunizations that are required in order to be able to work in the hospital setting, as well as a police information check. Um, that you would be required to complete uh, upon acceptance into the program. Okay. And then there was just one more I see in the Q&A, and it was just around if you're, if you're having some mental health struggles, could that affect your application? Uh, and maybe you could just speak to what type of resources are available if you became a student at SAIT. Yeah, absolutely. And Nate, we have uh, quite a few resources um, where we have for students available throughout your entire length within the program. We have counselors available in person, online. There's also peer support groups too. Um, and then in addition to that, we have learning advisors, learning strategists. Um, there's also tutors that are available. So quite a wide variety of resources um, in terms of those supports if you're concerned about you know addressing any mental health problems that may come up through your time in the program um, from personal experience I can say that uh, the Celix I might be slightly biased but the Celix T team is very supportive we are very excited to see the students be successful and we're quite responsive in in checking in with students regularly so um, yeah I think there's just quite a few resources that we can mm -hmm. offer in that area that's awesome and I'll just apologize because I think I said SAIT which is a slip of the tongue for me because that's where I went to school so it's where my brain my brain defaulted uh is there a difference between taking 30-1 or 30-2 courses uh, when it comes to applications no so I believe what we had oh, I'm gonna go back to my page there 30-2 is the um, more challenging requirement. I'm from BC, so sometimes that doesn't always uh, <laughs> correlate for me, uh, but both would be accepted. Okay. Yeah, that was asked a couple times. And then I think you answered this already, but how long would it take to find out if you have conditional acceptance? I think you said after that interview process, it might be March or April, right? Yeah, we're hoping sooner. So if you complete your interview and you score really high, you do really well, like say maybe in the 80, 85 range, um, then you probably would receive conditional acceptance right away. If you have a lower score, then you'll likely be put on the wait list to see if um, spots open up, like we said, maybe four months later. So it it depends on how things go. You know, there still might be a chance and we do see every once in a while students change their mind and then we go back to our wait list and backfill right up until the program starts. So we have accepted students into the program fairly late um, if there's a change, change of heart that way. And what type of living accommodations are available for Nate students? So currently, Nate does not have a residence on campus, uh, but we do have a partnership with McEwen University where there is an opportunity for students to live in their residence, which is just down the road, not too far from, from where we're located. Um, and so that's what we can offer. And there's information on the website around that. Um, I know there's lots of areas in terms of apartments and, and things not too far by as well, uh, but it is a student's responsibility to find their own accommodations for the first year and the second year of the program. Can this program lead to travel x-ray and lab technologists and what other future upgrades we'll be able to get from this job slash program? 
Yeah, there are definitely companies that do hire CLXTs in a travel tech capacity, usually going to those very remote locations, mostly northern <laughs> areas, uh, but does come with some great opportunities there. And there are lots of opportunities to expand um, from graduation from the program. So we do have what we call advanced practice opportunities, and those are areas that are within our scope of practice, but not within the first, like within the program at NEAT. Um, so, but NEAT does offer courses in things like transfusion medicine, um, as well as um, bone density. You can learn how to do some bone density testing, um, IV starts or medication preparation for some of those area like clinics that support doing fluoroscopy um, exams that sort of thing. Um, personally, myself, I, I went on to complete my Bachelor of Technology at NEAT um, and then went and did my Master's of Education. So it, there is opportunities to ladder, as well as we have an MRI second discipline program at NEAT where you can take your experience in another health program and um, work into kind of doing a virtual capacity for a new modality. Mm. So lots of opportunities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how competitive is the program? I would say it's, it's fairly competitive. Uh, last year we had over 500 applicants. Wow. Um, yeah. So it is quite competitive. Mm -hmm. uh, how many applicants is there? Is there a limit? How many applicants I guess could go on the wait list? Uh, we do try to limit it. So we aren't setting unrealistic you know, hopes for anyone that's hoping to get into the program. Uh, I don't have the exact number on how many people that would be. Um, I'm not sure if you have this number off the top of your head, Lisa, but there was a question around what was kind of the average grade that was accepted into the program last year. Uh, for the interview score, I do not have that. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Fair enough. Um, there was a question around, would you need to take this program to become a radiologist? Ah, so actually a radiologist is a specialization um, from a doctor's um, experience and education. So wouldn't be opportunities to ladder into that unless you go back and do some medical education. Mm -hmm. And then there was a question, uh, can you do an MRI second discipline after the CLXT program? Yes, you can. Awesome. Those are some great questions. I think we, I don't see any at the moment. So I think we'll just take a pause. Lisa, you know, she'll be here for a little while longer. So if you think of anything else, we can get back to that. But I think we'll let Carter uh, share some of his experience right now in the program and out in the workforce. Um, so I will pass it over to you for now, Carter. Uh, so yeah, so kind of my uh, journey into the lab and x-ray combined program started in about 2019. Uh, I attended a Let's Go Rural Health Professions kind of, um, almost like they called it a skills competition at the hospital. So essentially our, my high school and the other high school in my hometown went to the hospital and went into all the different discipline areas of the hospital and we kind of learned what all the different professions do. We got to be hands-on with that a little bit and practice on, uh, on each other a little bit. And yeah, we just kind of got to get introduced to some of the rural health professions uh, that get offered more in uh, rural towns and sites like that. So I got really interested in the lab portion of the tour of the hospital and I really wanted to go into that. And well, to start, I guess I always wanted to go into healthcare. I just wasn't sure what field. So when we went to the lab, I really enjoyed that a lot. And then we also toured the x-ray clinic part of the hospital. And I thought that was even cooler, but you know, I really liked them both. And so they had a posting up on the wall of the combined lab and x-ray program. So I kind of just took a picture of that and put it up on my wall and always knew that's what I kind of wanted to get into since obviously 2019. And yeah, right out of high school, I applied. Like when I was in grade 12, I applied, I got a interview. And then 
I didn't get in actually my first year. Uh, I've, that was kind of a common theme talking to a lot of my friends in the program. Um, a lot of us didn't get in our first try and not, I'm not trying to kind of make people say that they're not going to get in their first try, but for me and a few other people, you don't, and that just happens, you know, but your second time, third time, if you have to, um, it feels a lot more comfortable doing it. I know for me personally, um, I took a gap year and then I applied to another program at Red Deer Polytechnic and started taking uh, occupational physiotherapy assisting. And I really did enjoy it, but I knew that I always wanted to stay in lab and x-ray. So in my first year of taking that program, I applied to lab and x-ray again for a second time, got another interview. And I found that the interview was a lot easier for me to answer the questions just because I was kind of coming from a healthcare background now. Now I've had more of that kind of knowledge and information on just what it is to work in healthcare. So then I got in and I kind of had to make a decision if I stayed in my current program or if I came to the combined lab and x-ray program at Nate. And I did decide to go to Nate instead and start fresh and kind of go into what I always wanted to do. And I'll be honest, I'm so happy I did because it's a fantastic program. Uh, like Lisa said, it is busy um, and competitive. It can be challenging at times, but it is, it's very rewarding. Like first year, you're very busy. Uh, there's lots of, uh, lots of exams and assignments to get done. But like I said, it's so rewarding once you kind of get through that first year. And once you move into clinical, it's, uh, it gets a lot like more hands-on as you kind of move out through, move uh, through your first year and into second year. And uh, yeah, one thing that I really would suggest about being in your first year is just make sure you have that work-life balance because um, it can be really overwhelming and a lot to do. And you can feel like all you have to do is school and like seven days a week, you got to do homework and study but it's really important to have kind of those extracurricular activities just to kind of keep your mind busy or kind of take your mind off of school a little bit and uh, just get outside, do some things. Like for me, like I had time, I played um, like junior hockey an hour away from Edmonton. So I was busy doing that on the weekends, but I found just keeping up with studying keeping up with assignments, you know, making lots of friends in the program. So you kind of have that support. Um, it really helps. And if I think back, if I just had school and didn't uh, play hockey or do anything else other than school, it would have been, it would have been honestly, I think a little more of a challenge because I would have never got a break. So that's something I can really stress is just making sure you kind of get that work-life balance in your first year. And then when you move into second year, I find it's a lot more self-paced for studying. Like you might not have as many assignments, but you're just kind of reviewing what you learned in the first year as you're going into the hospital. So for your clinical, you have to go in for your shifts that they schedule you for. So for me personally, I have a seven to three shift Monday to Friday. And then once I'm off, I'm free to leave. And I come home and I review my notes a little bit and Nate kind of guides you through what you should be going through um, on your own. And then if you ever have any questions for your preceptors while you're kind of reviewing and studying for like your licensing exam that you take once you're finished your practicum, your preceptors are always really glad to help you. And uh, yeah, second year is a lot of fun. I'm finding it's uh, you really kind of, uh, burn the skills into your brain that you learned in school. And, uh, you know, when you're in school in your first year, sometimes some, a few things here and there don't make sense to you. Like, you know it, but you can't really think of why you would put it into practice. Um, but then when you move into second year, it all really makes sense. And yeah, just the clinical learning experiences, it's unmatched. Like, you learn so much when you're in clinical and yeah, it's a really great experience. And also to answer a question I seen earlier that said, can you do the medical terminology and anatomy and physiology courses while you're in high school? 
Um, I, I did my medical terminology while I was in my grade 12 year. Um, see, since you only need like your uh, math, chem, bio, and English, I didn't take physics because I knew this is what I wanted to do. So I had a spare. And that was plenty of time I found to do medical terminology. And then my anatomy and physiology course, I believe transferred from my Red Deer program. So I didn't have to do that separately. But yeah, there was lots of time I found to go through medical terminology. It was, it was a lot, but it's a lot of information. But if you just keep working at it little by little, it, uh, it kind of makes sense and really prepares you for the program. You, you were able to go into the program with already like a foundation of knowledge. Um, so like when your instructors kind of start mentioning terms about anatomy or just kind of the medical field, you know what those are already. Yeah. And it really helps. There was a question, Carter, about where you took medical terminology from what school? Uh, I took medical terminology from Nate. I did it at like through the continuing education, the anatomy and physiology. I took it through Red Deer. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there was a question, somebody wanted to know, what do you think helped you prepare for the interview best? Um, just having that kind of um, foundational knowledge, like of healthcare already for my previous program really helped. Um, one thing that really, I think helped the most probably was I did some job shadowing of uh, CLXTs in my hometown. I did about three days and just kind of talked to them about like the program and some things I should be prepared for. And they kind of helped out a little bit and just gave me some resources, like some, like, I think they're called, one thing I really helped was I would Google, I believe they're called mini multiple interview questions. Mm. And there were sites online that gave you not the exact same, obviously, but really similar kind of questions that just kind of bring out your character. And I would go through those a lot with like my parents, like I would have them ask me them and I would just kind of respond. And even I would re at times record myself and then go back through it and just kind of see what I could improve on. Yeah, those are some great tips. Uh, Kate, my colleague, just put a link in the chat if you're interested. Um, Alberta Health Services has some information on job shadowing and I believe Alberta Precision Laboratories does uh, as well, which would be somewhere that you could get hired as a CLXT. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that, Lisa, if you know, but <clears throat> I think they have job shadowing opportunities as well that you can explore. Well, I'm gonna ask a question because I am not a CLXT and I think it's such an interesting job, but Carter, what is a, what is a day in the life kind of like working in combined lab and x-ray? Um, so for x-ray, I haven't started my x-ray rotation yet. So I can't really speak on that just yet. But for labs, so my day starts with going in at set, usually quarter to seven. Um, my job is to kind of start the lab and get it going and do startup. And there's a, like a senior tech there with you. And at the start, they'll kind of get you started on one or two analyzers and they'll help you walk you through it. And then right now I'm at my 10th week and now they... They're in the lab, they're present, but I kind of start up the whole lab, get the analyzers ready for the day. And if I have any questions, they're there to support me. But uh, once you kind of get through it, you're kind of, uh, you're kind of running it there with support, obviously. And then, yeah, your days can kind of look different in the lab, depending on which uh, bench you work at. Like for the first couple of weeks of practicum, you can be collecting. So you're out front collecting blood from patients, going on like acute care, collecting from inpatients and delivering them to the lab. Other days you can be working, say the hematology bench and where you're getting the samples that are coming into the lab, you're running it on the analyzer, uh, interpreting the results and sending them to like doctors if it needs to be done, making blood smears, looking at it under a microscope. And then same with chemistry, you're getting uh, chemistry samples that you have to run on a analyzer. And if there's anything that needs to be done, you just have to make sure that the, that the samples are being tested accurately and sent off properly. And same with urines too, you have to look at under the microscope as well. It's a lot of fun working in the lab and finding. And yeah, then you just kind of throughout the day, just make sure that the analyzers are running as they should be and producing accurate results. 
Awesome. Maybe Lisa, could you share a little bit about uh, the x-ray side of things? For sure. Yes. It, I, I will say that it largely depends on the site that you're working and the dynamic of how many techs are working. Um, there are a number of sites that are purely um, staffed by CLXTs. And so maybe, for example, you might have three CLXTs staffed um, during the day where someone starts at seven, like Carter was saying, they go and do the collections and then they start um, attend to any of the outpatients that come into the hospital later on. And then maybe there's another tech that's running the analyzers and um, completing quality control, that kind of thing. And then the third tech would be placed over in the x-ray department and so the first thing that they do when they come in is get the equipment going make sure that everything's in good working order look to see if there are any um, exams ordered for any inpatients or patients maybe from the emergency department and then they would speak to maybe nursing staff from those departments to see what their schedule is, you know, is the patient having breakfast right now? And maybe that now is not a good time to get them, that sort of thing. Um, so you, in x-ray, you're also involved in transferring patients, um, assisting them from maybe a wheelchair onto the x-ray table or in position if they need to be standing. Um, and then, of course, um, most of the communities that CLXTs work at would also have outpatients. So maybe a patient that went to see their doctor at the clinic and they come in with a requisition and they would just be completing exams as the patients come in. Each day looks very different. That's what I love about x-ray is that you never know uh, what exam that you're going to be completing. You know, maybe it's a hand, maybe it's a chest, maybe it's a foot. Uh, maybe you get to do all of them on one patient. <laughs> uh, it can be very different. And you do get that really opportunity to connect with patients and, you know, check in on them and help them providing care while you're completing those exams. And then also collaborating with other healthcare providers, like I said. So you, we do have mobile x-rays um, that we complete where we would drive our mobile x-ray unit maybe down to the emergency department and be working with the other healthcare members to complete those exams, those kind of more emergent situations. As a CLXT, um, I think some of the key characteristics I would say that are really important are, you know, definitely interpersonal skills and communication, um, high attention to detail. So we want to make sure that we're always producing the, the best quality um, images and accurate results in the lab. Um, you you will be working um, mostly on your feet. You're gonna be kind of going back and forth from the lab to the x-ray department, down to eMERGE, that kind of thing. So if you like to be up and moving, um, this is definitely a, a good role for you. And because it is always based on the patients that are coming in, there is a lot of variety between the two, two departments. Um, and the shifts that come in. So you, you get to be a part of a team, but then if you're working on, you know, an evening shift or on the weekend, you would also be doing it by yourself. So you do have some independent work that you have to be um, right prepared to do and, and rely on, you know, nurses, paramedics to work together if you need assistance, that kind of thing. Maybe, I don't know if you have anything more to add to that, Carter, what do you think? Uh, yeah, just kind of building on the, you're always on your feet, you're always running around and uh, there's always something to do. There's rarely a dull moment. You just have to be ready to always be busy and uh, yeah, always kind of running around. Uh, there was a question for you, Carter, around, and if this is too personal, you don't have to answer, but where you're doing your clinical and do you get any choice of the location? Uh, so I'm doing my clinical in Vermilion right now. And you are allowed to state where you'd like to go, but you can't like definitively decide where you go. So for me, I put like my top three all kind of close around home. And I did get one that was fairly close to home. So I was really happy about that. Um, there was a question around how long is the courses until you're completely done? So it's a two-year program. Uh, 38 
weeks in the first year at NEAT, 40 weeks in clinical. Are you aware of any funding available through this program if a student agrees to work at a remote community for agreed upon amount of time? So that sounds kind of like maybe a return of service type agreement. Yeah, not not so much return of service, um, but there are some bursaries or maybe grants is the proper term available for specific northern communities um, through the government. And so it's northern living allowance uh, and, and it is specific to where you're moving from, how, you know, the commute, mm-hmm. you know, the accommodations, those kind of things. So it is very specific tailored to each individual. Does this role help a lot with ultrasound? So ultrasound is another great career in diagnostic imaging. However, they um, don't use radiation like we do in x-ray and they do see lots of varying (laughs) stages of gray, similar to us in x-ray, but it is a very uh, different process of how they obtain those images. So I think in terms of your knowledge of anatomy um, and pathology would be beneficial, um, but it would be a a different process in in terms of the acquiring images and the technology used. Mm -hmm. Uh, Carter, when exactly did you go do your job shadowing? I did my job shadowing in my grade 12 years. So that would have been 2020. Um, I went over Christmas break. So I just went into the hospital, asked if I could do some job shadowing of the CLXTs there. And they gave me all the forms that uh, I just needed to fill out, bring back, and then just set up a few days. So like I said, I was just on my Christmas break. So I was able to go in during the day. And uh, yeah, it was just throughout the week. Uh, There was another question around, would this help with a lab tech career? Okay, so there are differences between a scope of practice for a CLXT and a med lab tech. And that being related to the dynamic of the testing available in rural health centers is slightly different. We have most all of the general, you know, common tests that occur um, for hematology, for chemistry, urinalysis, but any kind of specialty testing that would take place is shipped to the city to complete at the urban centers. And so they definitely do have more Um, bench areas or specialty areas that are not within our scope of practice. So for example, um, transfusion medicine, uh, microbiology, histology, and lots of special chemistry testings, things like they do at the provincial lab, that kind of thing. So if you are interested in working and living in the city, Um, I would suggest that the medical lab technology program is likely a better fit. Um, Even those people working in the city as an MLT um, wouldn't necessarily have as much interaction with patients. Um, They're doing more of the bench work. And then a medical lab assistant would be the one going out and collecting the blood and doing ECGs and things like that. So there is a little bit of difference there. Mm -hmm. Uh, This kind of ties into that question as well. Uh, So if you completed this program and worked in a rural community, but then circumstances arose where you had to relocate to a city, would you be able to find a position in a city with this program? So right now, I think in healthcare, there is lots of opportunity um, just based on the needs of of healthcare in general, um, where, you know, when I graduated from the program, I could definitively say no, (laughs) there were no jobs within the city, they would only be looking to hire MLTs or MRTs for x ray. Right now is a different story. Um, they uh, they do have openings for CLXTs in x-ray clinics uh, where you could do general x-ray and fluoroscopy, um, but they wouldn't typically be hiring a CLXT at one of the larger hospitals um, because you, it wouldn't be best use um, of your time for your scope of practice or their needs for the, the team. So I would say in some of those clinic opportunities, yes, but you wouldn't be using all of your knowledge and all of your skills that you learned from the program. Mm-hmm. Uh, would this course help if you were interested in going into pathology? 
I think, again, a pathologist is more of a specialty from a doctor's line of work. And certainly you would learn a lot through the, the lab side of things, but not to the same degree. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't, I don't think there would be like a, a bridging opportunity. You, you would be starting fresh from the, the education requirements there. So we will go ahead and say thank you to Lisa and Carter for sharing your knowledge, expertise, and experience with us. Uh, I hope all of the attendees tonight were able to gather some new information and we'll continue to explore how you could become a CLXT in the future. Um, I'd also like to encourage you, if this piqued your interest for CLXT or just any type of job in healthcare, uh, we have a great new resource. It's called the A to Z Rural Healthcare Careers page, and we're going to link it in the chat for you. It actually just launched yesterday. Um, so you can go there for more information on the CLXT position and a great video as to, as to what a day in the life looks like. And there's a variety of other uh, careers available right now, um, all careers that are open in rural sites. So this resource, like I said, it just launched yesterday. So be sure to keep checking back because we're going to keep adding more and more careers to the page. And you'll see that link right there in the chat. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us tonight. And we'd just like to wish you all a wonderful rest of your week.